There it goes. There it goes. <clears throat> All right, grow through discipline. This looks like a smattering of a bunch of, I'll work through this, but this is kind of an outline of multiple paragraphs that I wrote. <clears throat> All right, grow through discipline. So we're talking about uh, discipline, and this is very applicable whether you're a parent, uh, being a manager of oh. people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, brother. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, here we go. <clears throat> um, whether it's parenting, being a manager, or just your own personal growth, uh, in order to grow, you need to practice discipline. Or in order to facilitate the growth of your children, discipline is required. Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, as a parent, you're setting your kids up with the tools that they need to navigate the world. And that's really what the book of Proverbs overall, and one of the major themes is the wisdom being passed on from father to son. First nine chapters is all about that. I don't know how many times it says, son, listen to your father's wisdom. Please listen to your mother. Listen, listen, listen. Don't go down that road, go down this road. There's a choice here. You can choose wisdom or you can choose folly. Don't choose folly, please choose wisdom. And it's parenting. <clears throat> and so you're setting your kids up with the tools that they'll need in order to navigate the world later. There needs to be two things. There needs to be teaching, so you're adding good things, and there needs to be correction where you're subtracting the bad thing. It shouldn't be, <clears throat> it shouldn't be too, I guess, profound. When you read the, uh, when you read the epistles, Paul, this is basically how he outlines most of his application, like you need to subtract the bad things and you need to add these good things, like take off the old man, put on the new man in Christ. Parenting, very similar. When they do something wrong, there needs to be negative reinforcement. When they do something right, there needs to be positive reinforcement. And the sooner it happens after you see whatever it is, the better. Now, you know, the older they get, you can have more conversations. But like, if they're really small, it's like it, the more immediate it is, the the better. The more quickly the, the association between the action and whatever the reinforcement is goes together. But you need both. You gotta have both negative and positive reinforcement. They work together. They they do this. butterfly anyways <clears throat> in this day and age our culture errs in one direction and it's in the direction of more positive reinforcement to the exclusion of negative reinforcement i don't know if that's been your experience in school districts where it's like there's almost no negative reinforcement you can do all the positives like and it might not be completely to the exclusion of it, but it's like, we're going to go way in this direction. Uh, parents are, can be uneasy about disciplining their children because in part, I think, this is like trying to step back a layer and think about the cultural values that we have. Uh, I think in part, <clears throat> parents can be uneasy about disciplining their children because we have cultural values that we believe are paramount. Freedom and individuality. These are like, deeply American values, right? Therefore, to infringe on a child's freedom is to stifle their choice to become who they really are, their creativity, and their potential. Constraints are inappropriate. Freedom to explore is what children need. The problem is those values, while they are important, do not factor in a nature bent towards sin. Every child is a cute little sinner. I'll say that again for those in the back. Every child is a cute little sinner. <laughs> the cutest little sinners we know. They have the potential for goodness and evil. They can be creatively sinful. Who they really are may not correspond with the reality that God has created. What everyone needs, especially children, are boundaries within, within which they have freedom to express their individuality. Setting up and maintaining those boundaries is what it means to discipline your children. 
It also requires discipline as a parent to do this. You have to be self-disciplined in order to enforce discipline on your children. Jordan Peterson has a title of one of his chapters in his 12 Rules for Life, and it says, Don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Just take a moment and think about that. Like that summarizes it. Your children should not be your friend right now. They're small. Hopefully when they're older, you guys can become friends. But when they're young, they're not your friends. They're your responsibility. They don't know how to act in the world yet. And it's your job to teach them how to behave in the world. So don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. If you let them get away with something that makes you dislike them, guess what? They're going to do that with other people. And then everyone's going to dislike them. And then later in life, you'll just dislike them more. You'll resent them. Right? Don't think you're being kind to them if you overlook your children. Uh, if you overlook your children being a brat, if you think, oh, they'll just grow out of it. No, they won't. It's your job to help them grow out of it. That's what discipline is all about. They won't grow out of it. You have to enforce those boundaries. The growth only comes through discipline, which you're responsible for implementing. Kids will push against those boundaries to see if it's real. So let's say you, you spend a lot of time, you're at your house, Train your children how to behave at the dinner table. See that nodding head? That's right. It's like, it takes a lot of work, but it's like, you know what? After years, I think we got this down. And then you go over to someone else's house. You're like, what happened to all that training? What's going on here? Why are they acting out? What's, why? I, I don't understand. It's like, we're back at square one. I'm so frustrated. Ooh, uh. They're just seeing, do the rules still apply here? Like, I've tried and failed at home. This is a new space. Maybe the rules are different. Push. Push. You got to be there to go. Sorry, I'm the wall. This wall's not going anywhere. Push as hard as you want. But they will do that. So do the same rules apply in this new situation as in the old? If you're not correcting your children, not telling them no, not delaying gratification, not maintaining your standards, if you're excluding negative reinforcement and emphasizing positive reinforcement, be careful. Doesn't mean you can't raise children that way. There's plenty of children that are raised that way. But be careful. Because uh, don't be surprised when you begin to resent your children and take revenge on them by withholding attention and affection later. Because if you let them get away with doing things that makes you dislike them, then you're just going to dislike them. And then eventually, you won't even really want to be around them. And then it's like, ugh, just get on the tablet. It's easier this way. And they like mind meld with it. Technology. You're not actually raising them. You're just getting rid of a distraction and annoyance. That's not parenting, though. It's kind of a big deal. One of the immediate goals is to have your children understand how to behave in your home, and then that extends to church, and then in public, and then in the world. But everything starts at your home. One of the distant goals is to get your kids to practice self control and self-discipline. So the groundwork that you're laying as parents with your children is to get them to do this for themselves later. Ultimately, we want self-discipline, self-regulation, delay of gratification for myself. Like, I'm not going to go out and buy that thing that I really want, put it on credit, and then be in debt for the rest of my life. Like horrible credit card debt. Why? Because I was taught to delay gratification, maybe save and earn or, you know, fill in the blank. But that's what we need. I thought it reminded me of Colossians 3, 5 through 17. I'm going to read that out loud to you. But you'll see these, these kind of principles in the background. This is Paul writing to the church at Colossae. He says, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Mortify means put to death. So he's using, like, 
And it says your members that are upon the earth. Is he saying kill yourself? No, it's a metaphor. But the, the sin nature, that's what you should be killing. That's what you should be putting to death. But you need to do it. Self-discipline. You need to put to death the things that make you stumble, the sinful things that are in your life. What are those things? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time. This isn't like, oh, that horrible world out there. Oh, they're just going to hell in a handbasket. But I'm glad I'm saved. It's like, did you forget so quickly that that was you? Like, don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. What did God save you from? He did save you to something, but what did he save you from? Don't forget that he saved you from something. In, in the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Man, there's so much going on there. We don't have time. But it's, it's brilliant. Like your identity is in Christ, not in any other adjectival ad, uh, modifier. The noun. It's beautiful. Put on, therefore. So these are the things you're adding. Right, so the correction would be subtract all of these bad things. Here's the addition. Right, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you were called in one body, <clears throat> and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So teaching, that's adding. Admonishing, that's correction, one another. In psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God Father, by him. Ultimately, we want that. That's what Paul is emphasizing. He's like, you should be disciplining yourselves. Put away these things. Put on these things. Continually practice those things. And your, the process of sanctification is the growth and the subtraction of those respective things. And it takes time. Like, when you interact in the world, you have to have opportunities to practice forgiving people. That means you have to have someone wrong you, and then... You have to practice forgiving them. But it takes time to grow in those things. But you have to be disciplined about it. You have to tell you, it's like, no, 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 this is what I'm going to do. Will to do it. And then, through the grace of God, you actually become righteous. You actually become holy. But many times, there's two motivations for doing these things. Uh, there's fear or love. Many people behave morally out of the fear of punishment. And I think, for the most part, it's kind of where things start, but it's not where they should remain. Fear of punishment. This is how many unbelievers view Christians, uh, view the Christian's relationship to God. You only behave morally because you're afraid of going to hell. One interpretation, right? God is a moral monster, making demands on humanity and using his club of hell to force people to get in the line. He doesn't want us to be happy. He doesn't consider what we want. God is a narcissistic bully that only cares about himself and his worship. Oh. So, what happens if that's our theology? That's what we believe about God. He's just this bully that has the club of hell 
and people only get in line because they're afraid of going to hell. What if that's the motivation that you use? Like, what if that's the motivation that you use? Well, then it's mostly self-interest. I don't want to go to hell, so I'll believe, right? There's an outward compliance, but usually an inward resentment towards the authority. You tend to hate the authority because they're making you do something that you don't actually want to do. In my self-interest, I'm going to do. Really, that's not the Christian motivation. It's not. This ignores the real motivation for Christians to change their behavior and honor God. We don't want to disappoint someone who loves us. There's a relationship here. And we love him because he first loved us. Because God was willing to go to such lengths to demonstrate his love for us. Our response is gratitude and trust that God's discipline comes from a place of love and not just authoritative hate. So notice, your theology matters. What you believe about God, whether he's loving or hateful, will determine your motivation and thus your behavior. It'll also inform how you interpret Proverbs we're about to read. So, you read about discipline. When, you, when I say the word discipline, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Right? First thing. Corporal punishment. Yeah. I mean, we'll get there. Reading Proverbs, the rod of reproof, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. We, yeah, we're going to get there. <clears throat> but if all you saw without any other context was a parent spanking their child, your first thought about that, why that's happening, or just like your judgment on that will get right to the heart of what you think the motivation of that is for. Like, oh, your first thought is that parent is beating their child to keep them in line. Well, see how negative that sounds? <laughs> right? I'm trying to paint a very negative picture. Right? Or you can think of it as, wow, that, that parent really loves them, doesn't want them to go down the wrong path in life. So they're correcting them. That's a completely different kind of motivation that stems from love and not this angry, I'm going to beat my children into submission kind of thing. Before we go any further, got some Hebrew. It's Hebrew. Oh, there we go. All right, we have Yasar. Musar, those two words are very closely linked. Um, this one's kind of hard to say. Toka chet. I'll do the ha at the end. Chet. And then uh yacha at the end. Yeah. So these are these are the different words within the pro and I'll point them out as we go through <clears throat> when we read these proverbs. But yasar, the first one, it means correct or discipline, i.e., punish in order to improve behavior, implying the training of the person. So it can be translated as punish, be warned, or to teach. And all of these words are going to have uh, like a teaching element, but also the negative reinforcement of punishment for bad behavior. And so they're all kind of synonyms, and the Proverbs kind of play off each other <clears throat> with them. Musar, discipline, a correction that is a minor punishment for teaching. This word emphasizes more of the punishment for violating the teaching, which may include a rebuke. So there may be some talking involved, but usually it's the other word. The next one uh, it can be translated as chastisement, which means punishment, or instruction. And many of the Proverbs we're going to go over uses musar as instruction. So the teaching of a principle or axiom for life. That's what you're doing. You're teaching your children principle. It's always hard for me. Tokachach. It means to rebuke or a correction. So speak words which show strong disapproval with possible actions of punishment to follow. But this one emphasizes the, the, the speaking part. Yacha, which is to argue in a legal dialogue. 
think about that in in uh, the context of correction training your children like when you get into arguments <laughs> right i mean think about it have you, have you ever gotten into like like i'm i'm gonna make my points I've got my point like and you're laying them out right i mean it kind of fits right arguing a legal dialogue it also has the idea of being vindicated to be proven right and therefore blameless of accusations or rebuke Discipline, punish, implying one is guilty of violating a standard. All of those ideas swirl around this word. Depends on the context on how you end up translating it. Um, also, a note on the rod. This comes from a net Bible note on Proverbs 29.15. <clears throat> I have it up here because it was a long one, but also I think it's really good. So the word rod in this verse is a metonymy of cause. So... What that means, a metonymy is a figure of speech that you use a small part to represent a whole. So in this, car, in this case, the rod is the small part that represents the whole process of any kind of disciplinary action. It doesn't necessarily mean, because it's a figure of speech, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always a rod. It's just some method of discipline, the process of going through it, train your children. All right, so the word rod is a metonymy of cause in which the instrument being used to discipline is mentioned in place of the process of disciplining someone. So the expression refers to the process of discipline that is designed to correct someone. I want you to hang on to that because there's going to be a lot of talk of rods, proverbs, and correcting. And so have that in mind. Maybe a figure of speech. There's some... There's other times where it's like it's very clear they're talking about a physical rod, <laughs> right? But not every time. I wanted to bring that up. There, there are more ways to discipline than I'll just say spanking, right? That's the first thing that comes to mind when you discipline. You think, oh, spanking. Like, okay, that is part of it. But there's way more to it than that as well. Last little introductory thing. Is this justifying child abuse? Garrett, in his New American Commentary, again on Proverbs 23, 13 through 14, says this text focuses on the parent's desire to preserve the life of their child. Disciplining with a rod may save a child from an early grave, the result of an undisciplined life. So it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discipline you now so that way later you don't do something really foolish and kill yourself or someone murders you or doing really dumb things. This text does not justify brutalizing children. Parents who find it only too easy to apply the rod, so this would be corporal punishment, spanking, fill in the blank, and especially those who lose their tempers when doing so should consider Ephesians 6, 4, which says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So again, teaching and correction of the Lord. Yeah, if if you lose your temper and are easily angered, then probably the rod of correction is not the best method. And again, <clears throat> I want to emphasize this too. Proverbs are not universals. Or no, they are universals, but they're not going to have universal applicability in every single case. They're just general statements of truth on the way things usually work in the world. So, just because it says that, you know, it uses the rod of reproof, let's say, that doesn't mean every single infraction needs that kind of discipline. It just means there needs to be some kind of discipline. And then you use your wisdom on what you should do in that moment. So, first one is, uh, <clears throat> I've already read this long, long time ago when we first went through the first nine chapters, but I have on this side, it says, argument proven right. So that's that, uh, that last word, yaha, so argue in a legal dialogue. And I thought this was really interesting. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, despise not the chastening, the musar of the Lord. Right? So remember, that means uh, a correction with a minor punishment. Right? Don't despise the musar of the Lord. Neither be weary of his correction. This is tokachat. That's the verbal rebuke. 
For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. That's the yacha. That's the argue. Uh, that's the argue in a legal dialogue. So whom the Lord loveth, he argues with and tries to correct them. Like, think about that. God tries to correct you with his word by making really good arguments. Don't do that. It's really dumb. Even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. But that's what God is willing to do. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Isaiah 1. God tries to prevent us from going in the wrong direction. He uses musar, right, discipline, or correction, the minor punishment. And he uses verbal rebuke, but he also lays out firm principles. Like, don't do this. This is a bad idea. And he argues his case. It will lead to tragedy. What Proverbs is all about. <laughs> like, it's God doing that. Great. This next one also has this verb. <clears throat> uh, the yacha. So, Proverbs 15, 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth. Yacha. The scorner doesn't love the one that, that argues against them. You ever had that in a witnessing situation? I don't know, at the fair booth? One really tries to dig their heels in and they're like, ah, the God stuff is, that's just a fairy tale to keep people in line. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. A scorn, someone who's scornful does not love someone that is trying to correct them with rational argumentation. Neither will he go to the wise. Just, I'm right, I don't care what anybody else says. That's a fool. There's no way you can know everything. Like you just, just take that with you. There's no way you can know everything. And so you're probably wrong about a lot of things, or someone could teach you something. You just have that packed away in your back pocket. And then like when someone's trying to correct you or something, you go, okay, I know everything. And then analyze what they're saying and go, well, no, they're still wrong. Like still come to a conclusion. But have a humble a humble heart about that. Could be wrong. I don't know. Scorner? They do not believe they're wrong. They are right. And they'll let you know about it. There we go. Proverbs 10, 17. <clears throat> this is, uh, we're getting into a new section. This is about discipline and correction. This is where Musar and Tokachat are kind of juxtaposed together and in a lot of in a lot of ways really short kind of pithy statements so he is in the way of life that keepeth musar instruction translated instruction musar but he that refuseth reproof to erith remember to is about uh like a verbal rebuke that kind of correction and musar can be instruction but also kind of has the idea of punishment behind it as well so, he that's in the way of life keepeth instruction. He learns from the punishment and then keeps that. Protects it, guards it, holds on to it. Kind of integrates it into their life so they don't do that thing again in the future. But he that refuseth even a verbal rebuke. Hey, that was wrong. Like, hey, we could tighten up in this, uh, you know, this is a business, customer service. We could probably tighten this up. And then they get all like, I manage the front desk at the Alaska Rock Gym. It's like, hey, don't sit on the counter. It's unprofessional. You're gonna get mad. I'm the boss. Like, don't sit on the counter. Makes me mad. Don't make me mad. I guess <laughs> I don't like it. It's one of my pet peeves. Just don't do it. Like, I'm gonna call you out on it, right? So if someone goes, well, you're infringing on my freedom. It's like you have the freedom not to work here anymore. Like. Just don't do that thing. It really bothers me. Please don't do that. If they won't even listen to that, they err. That's foolish. Proverbs 15, 5. A fool despiseth his father's musar, instruction, but he regardeth reproof, tochachat, or he that regardeth tochachat is prudent. They're wise. It's practical wisdom. Like, you're 
learning how to live morally in the world. Yeah, that really fell. Twelve one. <clears throat> Whoso loveth instruction, Musar, loveth knowledge, but he that hateth Tochachath is brutish. Brutish means you're like an animal. Not not clearly thinking. Need need physical force in order to like you need a bit in your mouth to be forced to go in a direction. Like if you hate reproof, if you hate that kind of correction, the verbal rebuke, you're like an animal that just needs force in order to go the right way. Not wise. <clears throat> Proverbs 15, 32, he that refuseth instruction Musar despiseth his own soul. Not only is it that you um, despise your father's instruction, so you're despising your father by extension, you're, own, you're, you're despising your own life, your own soul, if you despise instruction, if you refuse instruction. But he that heareth tochachath getteth understanding. You get understanding on how to live your life. Proverbs 13, 18. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth Musar, instruction. But he that regardeth Tochachat shall be honored. So there's, like, if you regard these rebukes, that implies that there's humility about you as you're willing to take in new information and change your behavior based on that. And that humility will be honored. Right? Before honor is humility. It's a different proverb, but that eventually. But that's what that's getting at. <clears throat> correction is grievous. So that word for correction um, is musar, that, that punishment, right? Punishment for doing something wrong. That correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. And the way is the way towards wisdom, towards life. And he that hateth tochachat shall die. Like, that's the ultimate road. Follow the way of foolishness. The end of that road is death. Don't go in that direction. There will be people in your life that are telling you, don't go in that direction. But if you hate that, disregard it, you're just on the way to death. And we're trying to stop you, but I guess you're going to do Don't do that. Now, raising children, it requires discipline. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I mean, like, it's like one of the most commonly quoted proverbs I think I've ever heard, right? And is that the same for you? Is that like, you've heard that over and over and over, right? Usually you hear it one way, but it cuts both ways. It doesn't tell you which way, I guess it says should go, but it means like train up in the way that they're going, right? Anyways, this cuts both ways. Usually we think about it in a positive way. Raise them godly and they'll not depart from godliness. But the inverse is true too. Fail to stop them in their evil way and they'll not depart from that either. When they're old, they're not going to depart from it. Net Bible note says, uh, the expected consequences of such training is that it will last throughout life. Sages were confident of the character-forming quality of their training. However, proverbs are not universal truths. One can anticipate positive results from careful child training, but there may be occasional exceptions. Again, proverbs are not, are not uh, promises. Proverbs are not promises. But train them up the way that they should go. <clears throat> Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Foolishness, what is this? This is folly. It's a state of being devoid of wisdom and understanding with a focus of the evil behaviors which occur because they're in that state. That's from the uh, Dictionary of Bible Languages in Hebrew. So the idea here is suppress folly and develop potential with discipline, the rod of correction. And that's Musar, the rod of Musar, correction, punishment, punish 
the evil things. And it's like that that also says a lot about our uh biblical anthropology. That's a fancy word of like what it means to be a human being according to what the Bible teaches. Right? Or to get at it another way, like our sin nature. Foolishness is it's bound up in there, in the heart of a child. It's already there. If you leave a child alone, foolishness will take place. So you have to put boundaries in the way so that foolishness doesn't just explode everywhere. That's what's bound up in the heart of a child. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chastiseth Musar him betimes. So, the Net Bible Note has a note. The importance of parental disciplining is stressed by the verbs hate and love. Hating a child in this sense means, in essence, abandoning or rejecting him. You're just abandoning them to their own devices. <laughs> Don't abandon them to their own devices. <laughs> that wasn't part of the Net Bible note. I just made that up right now. Um, loving a child means embracing and caring for him. <clears throat> Failure to discipline a child is tantamount to hating him, not caring about his character. And then that word be times, it means being diligent in disciplining, to be prompt. There. It happens. Like, the action happens, there needs to be addressed then. And if you're, not, <clears throat> if you're not in a place where you can address it, then it's like, we are going to deal with this later. This will happen. This is not going to go, you know unnoticed, like, we are going to deal with this. Parental discipline. Proverbs 19, 18. Chasteneth, <clears throat> this is, yes, uh, yeah, yasar, um, thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Like, have you ever seen a child who knows they're going to get a spanking it's not just like, no, I don't want this. There, there may be a few times where they're just like so resolved to not, I don't care what you do to me. And they're, they're just like, steel spine, I don't care. You can't make me flinch. And it's like, oh, this is not having the effect that it needs to have change tact. I don't know if you've ever seen that, where it's just utter rebellion and I am fixed. On this point, like, hmm, maybe the the rod is not the best. Maybe the mother. I saw this. Uh, I guess it was a TikTok or a reel or I don't know, one of those little short form videos, and it was this kid who was staring at his mom. He just like tore his school book in half. Like she was already telling him, "Don't do that." Like ripped the cover off, and then he was just tearing sheets out of the book from, that he got from his school. And he was looking her in the eye. And he, and he, and he told her, what are you going to do about it, little girl? I was like, <laughs> you know, like, whoa! But the defiance, the rebellion, like, it was, I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, it. like, this is real. Wow. This is crazy. And then, because the mom was the mom was recording it, which I'm like, oh, it's... but people record everything now. I don't just immediately flip my phone out and start recording things, but maybe some other. Yeah, <laughs> right. Not your failures, but this was this was a win. So like, it cuts over to the dad, and he's already walking out the door with the kid's teeth and his PlayStation Four. And he puts it underneath the back tire of the Escalade. And his mom Shoot. runs it over. And the kid is just bawling. Right? He's like, no, don't do this. Oh, no. It's like, did that get his attention? Yeah. Like, you do not get to treat your mother this way. And then you run over. It's like, this is something that he loves. Boom. Now you don't have that thing. Guess who gave it to you? It can be easily taken away. You don't get to disrespect your mother. That's a lesson. That will save his life later. That kind of disrespect towards people in authority 
later. I don't know. What if he treated the police like that? They're not going to be so, <laughs> like, they're not going to put up with that. Like, yeah, you're going to save his life. Anyways, he's got to have some teeth behind him. Don't, but if you don't do those things, then you hate your children. Or don't let, yeah, spare not, yeah, let not thy soul spare for his crying. It'll be okay. Withhold not correction, <clears throat> this is Musar, from the child. For if thou beatest him with a rod, that means strike. King James English, so in the 1600s, beatest. It means strike. Strike him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Out of a big deal. Whatever method of discipline you use, make sure it has teeth. It has to hurt. It's the pain that teaches. The lessons that you learn the hard way are not soon forgotten. You know that in your own life, where you've had to dig yourself out of a giant pit that you dug yourself into. Like, those are not soon forgotten. The rod of reproof gives wisdom. Rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother shame. Left to himself, that means left unrestrained, let loose. Don't do that. There's more how discipline interacts with the law, but that was the second bell. So we will jump forward to our verse alert and go over the verses.